So we have one week to go, guys. Election is is one week from today. And as I have been saying for a few weeks now, uh, I think it's it's appearing that Donald Trump is in quite a bit of trouble. Um, it looks like Joe Biden will be the next president. Obviously, with mail-in voting and the pandemic and, you know, there are a lot of factors this election that are difficult to predict or that could throw a wrench in um, what the polls are saying. But as as we sit right now, it, it looks pretty bad for Donald Trump. And the reason for that is is really that... It, states have continually kind of moved towards being blue. So some states that were deep red or light red and some states that are light red were light red are kind of toss ups now. And some states that were toss ups are light blue now. Like it's it seems like a lot of states are kind of just making that shift. Right. So states like Michigan and uh, Pennsylvania and Wisconsin, you know, look pretty solidly Joe Biden. Pennsylvania, kind of the state. If Biden wins Pennsylvania, it is very difficult for Trump to find a path to victory. Okay. Um, so those states that, that really decided the 2016 election look a lot better for Biden than they did for Hillary. States like um, Florida looks closer for Biden than it did for Hillary. Arizona, Georgia, states that shouldn't really be toss ups. Iowa, like some states that should be solid red states are now kind of toss ups. And even if, you know, I think Iowa is likely to go Republican, but it, even just it being that close is indicative of an overall shift. You know, um, it, it looks now like the Democrats have a really good shot at like Georgia and Arizona. And if they win those kind of states, Trump is is in trouble. Right. Um, there are a couple states Democrats view as hopeful that I think are likely to still go red like Texas. Um, it's listed as a toss up kind of largely, but. I think it's likely we'll see Trump win that state by a couple points, um, just like he did in 2016. Florida is another one. Interesting dynamics, guys. Um, the Hispanic voters in Florida are are holding firm with Trump. Democrats have long kind of, I don't know, used this messaging that like there's this inevitable shift towards Democrats, you know, because of young generations and because of demographics. And they often point to the sort of sleeping giant that is the Hispanic voting caucus. And what I mean by that is they are um, Hispanic voters are less likely to turn out than other demographics. That's been noted over the you know history of our elections. So Democrats have long kind of just assumed that because Republicans have such um, gross rhetoric on immigration that the Hispanic vote would would sway Democrat and be energized to turn out for Democrats. And Trump is holding at 35, 40 percent of the Hispanic vote in Florida. It's very likely to hold the state for him. Um so, you know, states like Texas, he's 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 at 35, 40 percent of the Hispanic vote. So Democrats have just been wrong about that. And it's it's actually they're basically unwilling to even reach out to that community. I can tell you from personal experience, I worked or I volunteered rather for the Bernie Sanders campaign in Nevada. Um, and I I was out of the office in UNLV, which is like kind of south um, Vegas and um, we were working East Vegas, which is a heavily Hispanic community. And that community had not been reached out to by Democrats, you guys. They'd just been entirely ignored by Democrats. So the fact that Bernie Sanders staffed up with like Spanish speaking staff and, and created a Spanish speaking hotline and put out literature in Spanish and actually sent volunteers out to these communities to interact with these voters and ask, how can we serve you here? Here's the policies that we think will help this community, you know, just reaching out to them like any other community is all that you have to do to like the Democrats. It's really gross, guys. They, they, they play the identity card and then they kind of just ignore these kind of communities right and then point at the republicans and go xenophobe xenophobe you know and not that that's inaccurate but like you're refusing to serve that community while you pretend to do this lip service thing it's it's just it's gross you know so anyway across the the sunbelt that could 
present itself as a problem for Democrats in the future. But I do think there's a strong enough anti-Trump sentiment that Biden is going to carry through this election. Um, to get into some of the numbers, Real Clear Politics has the national average at Biden by 7.4. That is, that is quite a bit more than Hillary was, was at a week before the election. In Battlegrounds, their average is 3.6 for Biden. The only one of those six, the six battleground states were Florida, Arizona, North Carolina, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, and Michigan. The only state that they have Trump ahead on the averages of those states is Florida. Um, and it was by like half a percent or something. Um, 538's national average looks even rosier for Biden by quite a margin. It's it's 9.1. They have Biden up on a national uh, average. So things looking very rosy for Biden. That's not the kind of lead, even with the electoral college benefiting Trump, seven, nine point kind of leads are not really overcomable. Um, especially when we see these states like you know, if Trump's having to fight for Iowa and Georgia and Arizona and North Carolina and Ohio, he's got no chance to win Wisconsin and Michigan and Pennsylvania and Florida. And right. Like, see, I think he's going to win Florida. But my point being, like, if he has to allocate all his resources to states that are supposed to be red states that have become swing states, he then cannot allocate his resources to what were the swing states in 2016. Do you see what I mean? It becomes too much to try to tackle, essentially. So as we see more of these states, and these are not small states either, guys, like Georgia, Arizona, not small states. Florida is a very large state. Ohio is a very large state. So these are not states that he could could seemingly afford to lose. Um so anyhow, it, it, it just really looks bad for Donald Trump on the presidential level, guys. Um, you know, my position has been to vote green, but I'm sure that a lot of liberals are happy with with this analysis. Again, I want to put the caveat out there, though, they, like New York State it, during their primary process ended up throwing out some hundred thousand ballots on technicalities. So if we see in a bunch of these states, if we see, you know, hundreds of thousands of ballots tossed, who the fuck knows what kind of an impact that could have on the election? I really don't know. You know, things like the pandemic with polling locations, and I really don't know what kind of an effect this could have on the election. So that is um, the one caveat I want to give is that, you know, it's difficult to predict this particular cycle, and that could lead to some very unfortunate and volatile and violent situations. And I am actually very scared that that's going to be the case. Um some states are going to take multiple days to get a final count. And if we're in a situation where we don't know the actual results of the election for days and there are claims of fraud, I see that manifesting itself in this cultural environment in very violent and troubling ways. And I think that's something we're all going to have to look out for. But um, anyway, to move on here to some of the key Senate races. You know, I just I, I'm going to talk about this kind of broadly, but it's I'm using real clear politics analysis. They basically say that there are nine Senate seats up for grabs. Um, and before those nine Republicans are at 46, Democrats at 45. So, so Democrats in order to take a majority would have to win six of those nine. Um, and that looks not terribly unlikely at this point. Basically, there are a lot of close races. This is again, guys, it's like, these races don't necessarily, there's a couple, you know, I think Susan Collins is in real trouble in Maine. There are a couple races where I think there could be a big discrepancy in the actual vote count, but a lot of these races are going to be close. And what's happened is Senate seats that are supposed to be kind of deep red Senate seats, like South Carolina with Lindsey Graham, you know, um, are, are suddenly up for grabs because of the volatility of the political environment. So Lindsey Graham may well lose to Jamie Harrison in South Carolina, and it would be incredibly rare for a Democrat to win a statewide seat in South Carolina. Right. So Democrats could benefit from from that, that the political environment in that sense, where it's not like they're running away with their seats so much as Republican seats are coming kind of up for grabs. Right. Tillis in North Carolina, that really should be a Republican seat. North Carolina is more of a swing state lately, but um, with senators, they've tended to to stay Republican. And, um, you know, the fact that Tom Tillis is vulnerable there is another indication that, that Democrats have some hope for the Senate this um, 
this cycle. Like I said, I think Susan Collins is in trouble. The fact that um, Iowa might be a state where Democrats could win a Senate seat. Like some of this, some of these are really quite surprising, guys. Um, and then there are seats like in Michigan. I think Peters is probably going to win pretty handily, especially considering Michigan is is strongly supporting Biden over Trump at this point. Um, so it's I think that Democrats will win five or six of those nine. And I think that so I think we're either going to have like a 50 50 Senate where Kamala Harris or Mike Pence is the tiebreaker or we're going to have Democrats by one. It could very much be 51 49 Democrats. Um, so um, it, it's in many ways a good looking environment for the Democratic Party. But it's also a very volatile election and, and none of that is set in stone because of the, uh, you know, the potential influences that I mentioned with, with mail in voting and with the pandemic and these, these, these outside influences, you know. Um, and I also want to note how disappointing it is to me that, that the Democrats, um, may well just basically be rewarded for, um, like the, the Republicans are so, off the cliff to the right and so extreme that the Democrats are, are likely to be rewarded for spitting in their base's face again. Um, and in the, in the long term, guys, this manifests itself in, look, you can, you can make harm reduction arguments over the next four years, all that you would like. And those are legitimate arguments. Okay. You can point to impoverished communities and say they will be a little bit better off under Joe Biden. And in many cases, you're right to make that argument. And if you want to try to say, you know, on environment and on these big picture issues that, that we're going to be a half inch better under Joe, you can make that argument. Okay. But in the long term, you're endorsing the Democrats' choice to spit in the face of the left. You're confirming to them that they do not need to do bold policy. So in the long term, are you going to look back in 20 years and say, boy, I wish I would have just nipped the Democrats bullshit in the bud, it, you know, 20 years ago, instead of continuing to, continuing to let them do their marginal garbage that's not going to solve the problems we face, Right. It, it's you can make the harm reduction argument all that you'd like, but when you're making that argument every single election cycle, you're participating in a bigger picture system. You know, you're 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 voting for the status quo in a long term sense. You're refusing to put your foot down and say we need actual change. You're supporting the party that participates in the system that gives us two shitty candidates every single election cycle. Okay. So I just want people to be honest about it. If you're going to make a harm reduction argument, just don't pretend that that's limited to this election cycle. Don't pretend that you that you're voting for a party that's actually going to solve the climate crisis. Be honest and just say I'm voting for a party that might delay it by a couple years. Just be honest. You know. So anyway, um Sorry to go on a little, you know, my own ideological rant or whatever, but um, looks like Trump is in trouble. Looks like Democrats are going to to have a, a good night a week from tonight. Of course, it looked that way last year or four years ago, too, last time, too. So, you know, who knows? But um, to me, the polling does look very different this time around than it did in 2016. And unless uh, COVID or mail-in plays a major role, I think Donald Trump uh, can start packing at this point.